Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Integrate Professional Development webinar series. The Integrate project aims to promote faculty teaching about the earth in the context of society. Integrate is a NSF-funded STEM talent expansion project. Its two overarching goals are first, to develop materials and curricula that are adaptable and adaptable for faculty to increase earth literacy for all undergraduates. And second, to increase majors in the geosciences and related fields to develop a workforce capable of tackling environmental and resource challenges. This webinar is part of a series supporting teaching with Integrate principles using the piloted and peer-reviewed Integrate developed and curated materials as tools. Uh, on the screen and in the chat box, there is a link to the webinar event page where you can find the presentation slides, uh, resources related to the presentation, and afterwards, a recording of the webinar. If you have any questions along the way, you can type them into that chat box. Uh, to access that, find the Zoom control bar and click on chat. That'll open that window. Uh, during the webinar, please leave your audio muted and video off. Uh, that'll help us get a good recording. And note that if you joined from a browser, you might not see uh, some of the interactive options. I'm happy to introduce today's speakers, Beth Bartell and Wendy Bowen, who will be presenting Communicating Science to a Broad Audience, Social Media for You and Your Students. In this webinar, Beth and Wendy will discuss the power of social media for science, best practices, how you can support your students in effective social media use, and tips for contentious communication that can be applied in all forms of communication. At the end of the webinar, we'll wrap up with some group discussion about how you plan to use social media in your own work or with students. And with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy and Beth. Hi, everyone. This is Wendy. I'm going to um attempt to share my screen now. So let's see, we'll hang on for just a sec to make sure I can do this properly. How does that look? Anyone? Hello? Uh, just start the slideshow. All right, perfect. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate your interest. Um, in the topic about communicating science using social media because we think it's a really important thing to do. So we're going to start, kind of start the story at the beginning, uh, just by defining what social media is and what it is not. So in general, social media allows the creation and exchange of user generated content. And there are multiple kinds of social media. The type that we deal with uh, for science communication, we have things like collaborative projects, that would be like Wikipedia, blogs and microblogs, that would be Twitter and WordPress, <clears throat> content communities like YouTube, and social networking sites. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. And those are things like Facebook and Twitter. Email and instant messaging are considered to be technology, so they don't count in the social media realm. I kind of love this little slide that goes through uh, what vintage social networking <coughs> used to be versus what it is now. So if we start at the top here with Pinterest, uh, that's like your old time uh, bulletin board. You put up recipes, you can put up lesson plans, pretty pictures of places you've been, anything that's kind of visual that you wanna keep a record of and keep in one place. YouTube is like your window. That's uh, your, your view to the outside world. People post videos, you can see things as they go by. We're not gonna talk about Reddit or Skype or Tumblr, but you can get the idea from the pictures. Facebook here is like your address book. That's where you keep track of your family and friends and your personal contacts. Twitter are like post-it notes, short, sweet, to the point, small little snippets that you can keep track of. WordPress is like a blog, that's kind of like your diary or like a paper that you're writing. Instagram is your family photo over here. Instagram is primarily used for sharing visual content like photographs. And then LinkedIn is a professional uh, networking site and that's like your old timey Rolodex. One of the questions we get asked a lot is how much time do each one of these uh, different things take? So this is a great graphic from AGU Sharing Science. If you look over here, you can see the time, uh, the length of each post, whether or not uh, that particular platform uses images, uh, what the audience is, and the demographics of that audience. So this is mainly for your reference for later to look through this. Uh, we wanted to point out a few terms that we're going to be using just to make sure that uh, we can define those for you. A hashtag is used mainly for Twitter, and that's when you have the pound sign in front of a word, and that lends that word importance, and it also makes it very searchable. Platform, that's just the different social media sites. SciComm is short term, short 
lingo for science communication and a troll or trolling, that's uh, people on the internet who purposefully sow discord or derail conversations, usually for their own amusement. They're not there for actual um, productive discussion. All right, so we'll take a quick look at the global digital snapshot. This is uh, something that comes up from Hootsuite. So there's about 7.5 billion people in the world. About 3.8 billion of those people are internet users, and there's about 2.8 billion active social media users. And these people are all over the world. So we have a lot of people that use social media in North, South, and Central America, uh, a lot in Australia, East Asia, West Europe, but really it is kind of a global phenomenon. So we're able to reach out to and connect with people all over the globe. This slide is always really interesting. Um, probably take you a minute to find the United States. You might expect us to be near the top of the pack over here on the left, but it's actually the Philippines. These are the people that spend the most time on social media, about four hours a day. Japan spends the least amount of time on social media, and here's the United States in the middle here at about uh, two hours a day. So bear in mind, this isn't email, this isn't Google, this is just social media. It's kind of extraordinary. So. We know that people all over the world are using it and they're using it often. So this gives us a great uh, medium for disseminating science. So how is social media being used by scientists? Well, in general, scientists are using it to communicate general science and research to the public. They're also using it to facilitate, network, and exchange knowledge within the scientific community. And of course, scientists are people too. They're using it for personal use to keep in touch with family and friends around the world. Now, there was a study done by Collins in 2016. Uh, it was about 600 self-identifying scientists on Twitter, so a little bit of selection bias there. But he wanted to know what social media platforms scientists were using and what they were using them for. So most people use Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Most of the people that he surveyed, about 78%, were ages 21 to 39, and 54% of the people surveyed held a PhD. Of the scientists that were using Facebook, 75% follow pages about science. Now, this is something we'll discuss in a little more detail soon, but um, when people post about science, uh, scientists, they, they do it pretty irregularly. It's really something that we need to explore and something we need to utilize more. But when scientists post about science, they tend to talk about their field experiences or their lab experiences. They're getting uh, inspiration for outreach or science communication. They're trying to make connections with other people, and they're also trying to correct misrepresentations of science that they see coming across their, their news feeds. On Twitter, uh, they tend to tweet about research in their field as well as their personal research, research outside their field. They do some science communication and outreach, and they also talk about their personal experiences. And this is really important because it helps to humanize science, which builds trust. So how is social media being used by earth science educators? Now this is a huge topic and there are so many uses that we couldn't possibly cover all of them. So we're just gonna pick out some highlights that, that came to mind for us and then we're gonna highlight the work of some uh, education professionals and how they're using these things in the classroom. So social media is often used to stay up to date on new science and breaking news. Some really good examples uh, from what's been happening recently are the eruption in Kilauea. The USGS has been doing a bang up job of communicating not only the science of what's happening and why it's happening, but staying up to date with the, the data that's coming in, what that means, and then dealing with emergency and communications personnel to make sure that people are safe and that people around the world are informed about what's happening and what to expect. And they're doing a lot of this communication in real time on social media. So if your students are following this or if you're following this, you can keep up to date on exactly what's happening, usually hour by hour. So here are some examples. This is from their Twitter feed, USGS Volcanoes. This is from their Facebook page. They're showing great pictures. They have great videos. They have uh, links to maps. So this is something you could start the day with in your classroom, or this is something you could ask the students uh, to follow you know, on their own time as a homework assignment or something. A lot of organizations are also creating things that are meant to be used in the classroom and posting them on social media in a timely way. So for instance, Iris, uh, after any newsworthy earthquake, we put up something called the Recent Earthquake Teachable Moment. And that's a PowerPoint uh, slide deck that's meant for classroom use that's prepared by educators and seismologists. And it goes into 
the societal impacts of the earthquake, the geology of the earthquake, you know, what we can expect to happen next, all of these things that you want to really um, take into your classroom to grab the moment, capture that moment of interest. And these are uh, sent out <clears throat> on Facebook and Twitter so that they can get out really quickly. It's also on our website, but these are our main dissemination tools. We're not the only one doing these sorts of things. This is what I mainly use social media for. It's to follow scientists that are discussing science issues in real time. And this is happening all the time on Twitter. In fact, they call it Sci Twitter, Science Twitter. We'll go through some of the examples down here. I just pulled these off from things that were going across my newsfeed. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, some seismologists that are discussing a recent paper that came out that was talking about the earthquake cycle. So they're debating the merits of that. Has this theory been debunked? Is it good for education? What's it good for? In the center, <clears throat> A professor from Cal Poly Pomona had posted an image showing the subsidence of uh, the summit of Kilauea after the Fisher eruption started. And a, just a person from the internet said, you know, how, what does this matter to the layperson? What does that actually mean? And so she actually takes the time to explain what it means and why it's important. So it's a great outreach tool and people use it as such. Facebook, this isn't happening quite as often, or it's a little harder to find these uh, groups, but they are out there and they can be incredibly informative uh, places for discussion and places for learning. So for instance, the Pacific Northwest Earthquake Discussion Group is a group of amateur seismologists, interested people that live in the region, and scientists that all get together, they ask questions, they answer questions, they talk about the data, and it's a really great um, open forum learning experience. Another way that social media can be used in the classroom is to connect students to scientists. And somebody that is doing an absolutely exemplary job of this is a high school science teacher named Adam Taylor. Uh, his Twitter handle or his Twitter uh, username is Two Foot Giraffe. And he uses uh, Twitter to connect scientists to his students. On his blog, which I've uh, included a link to, and I recommend if you're interested in doing these sorts of things, so you check it out because he has all sorts of resources. He says that connecting students with scientists and other professionals is one of his primary goals. Most of his students will not grow up to be scientists or science teachers, but they might remember real discussions with real scientists through social media. And Twitter is the easiest way to get students connected. He uh, goes on and he pre-vets a lot of these scientists, and then he has his students talk to them and ask them questions. In some instances, he brings this into the classroom. He arranges Google Hangouts with the students and scientists. And I was part of one of these. It was really fantastic. The students were very engaged. They were very interested. We had three different um, earthquake professionals talking about earthquakes. Really, really a, a good use of um, social media resources. So here's an example of something that he's doing to help facilitate this, and it's a hashtag. Again, that's a, a thing that you can use to kind of draw attention to something or to name something, and it's uh, Sci Stu Chat. And so this is something that happens, uh, I think it's like one Thursday a month where scientists and students come together to talk about science on social media. And another reference uh, and information that he can give you, he had to work really hard to get Twitter unblocked in his school district. And he made such a strong case for using social media in the classroom that his school district eventually did unblock Twitter. They had a whole thing with parents and explaining why it was important. And it was a, an overwhelming success. So if those are uh, things that you think might be problematic, at your school, at your university, he has a lot of resources for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another way that social media can be used is to expose students to new ideas. And these are um, points that were brought to us by a science educator named Heidi. Her information is here. And she said that the diverse views represented in social media help students to think about alternative ideas and discuss them. So this is helping with forming an argument, scientific reasoning. She also points out that it's an amazing opportunity for students to follow and network. So I have a, um, a graphic here from a study by Darling in 2013. One of the things that they point out is that the median Twitter following is 730 times larger than the mean university department size. So this gives your students an opportunity to really reach out beyond the people that they're exposed to every day, to people that may have similar interests, to find mentors, those sorts of things. Twitter is also free. And it really helps to highlight diversity within the sciences. It's a good bridge to my next slide, and I think this is really critically important. Social media can be used to change the perception of science and scientists. So you can use social media to show 
the representation of what science really is. It's field work, it's lab work, it's conferences, it's using computer models, it's lots of different things that are outside the box of what people generally think of when they think of science. It can also be used to show the process of science. So science isn't just form a hypothesis, do an experiment, draw a conclusion. Science is ideas, there are challenges, you make observations and discoveries, you have lots of failures, lots of spinning wheels, lots of questions, sometimes null results. There's arguments. Some things have scientific consensus and some things don't. You know, it, it really can help to show the dynamic nature of the scientific process that can really get students excited about science itself. And this is one of my big issues. It can help to change the representation of scientists themselves. We all know that uh, geoscience has a diversity problem. So the image in the center here is from AGI's workforce report that just came out recently, and it's showing the representation of graduating students in the geosciences. You see at the top, uh, graduates that have a BA or a BS in geoscience, 75% of them are Caucasian. So historically underrepresented minority students in science, they need to form communities people that are having the same issues they, they may be having. You know, there's all sorts of challenges that arise from being an underrepresented minority. And so this is a great place to form community, to find mentors, to really make people feel welcome and help them to feel welcome in the sciences. And there's a lot of resources, particularly on Twitter, that are working to that end. We have a few of them listed here. There's so many more. Black in STEM, Vanguard STEM, Girls Who Code, Disabled in STEM, Latina in STEM, Bi and Sci, Sci Mom all sorts of hashtags and groups that you can be a part of that really are a great support network. You can also uh, join initiatives to help uh, bring, uh, to amplify a lot of these uh, diversity issues. So for instance, Earth Science Women's Network is doing a science-a-thon to show what it's like to be a scientist. What's a day in the life of a scientist like? So I would encourage everyone to click on that link and to learn more about that. And then there are other initiatives that are happening that are a little bit more um, I don't want to say political, but things like Fund USA Science, support the EPA. There are hashtags called Still a Scientist, showing that scientists have a variety of interests outside of their scientific profession. Uh, there's a great hashtag called This is What a Scientist Looks Like. You can see an example over here of Miriam uh, in her kangaroo suit in the lab, wearing a face mask. She's an Iranian scientist. She's showing her cultural heritage. She's also a science communicator. So this is an opportunity to show uh, the diversity of science, to humanize science, uh, and to show that women can be scientists too. Social media can be used for networking and professional development for scientists and science teachers. So maybe you're not able to leave the classroom to go to a conference, don't have the money to go to the conference, you can follow along online. I just looked up uh, NSTA18, the hashtag, and I got a whole slew of results. So you can follow that in real time. And there's also multiple lists and ways to find other educators that may be teaching what you're teaching and uh, kind of grow your network that way. You can use social media to organize your materials, to keep track of different sites that you think are interesting, to keep track of images that you want to use in presentations, or to keep track of your lesson plans. And Pinterest is a great place for this. So I just went to Pinterest and I typed in UNAVCO and it brought up all of these results of uh, pins or uh, things that UNAVCO has saved or that reference UNAVCO, you can also go to their actual page and you can find their individual boards or their subsections. Here's one on educational materials, another one on maps and map tools. So this is a great way just to keep track of uh, all the things that you could be using in the classroom. All right, so how do we support students that are using social media? And this is a hard one because it can be tricky, right? There are a lot of minefields. We wanna make sure that we have student safety as a priority, and we wanna make sure that they're doing it correctly. So the first thing we need to do is set clear goals and expectations. What are you expecting the students to get out of using social media in your classroom? Be very clear about what you want them to do and what is not acceptable. Make sure that you're reviewing digital safety and digital literacy. I've included a link here uh, that's a really great resource. There's a lot of really good resources on this out there. It doesn't take a lot of work to find them. And just a brief review can be very helpful in orienting students and setting expectations. You wanna discuss proper social media etiquette and techniques. And I just pulled a little image over here that has some things that I think are important that maybe aren't discussed quite enough. Like if someone used the words from your post to define you, is that how you'd like to be remembered? 
are you portraying yourself in a way that you would like others to model? Are you being a role model? Do you need to explain this? Are you being understandable? Is what you're saying true and necessary? These are all things that we don't necessarily think of as online etiquette, but we want to make sure that our students are helping to increase the positive digital footprint. So some short little best practices here. <clears throat> don't be an egg. If you don't put your uh, a profile picture up on Twitter, it just shows you as an egg. And those people are always trolls. You don't want to be an egg. Have a profile picture. Have a, bi a biography. Be professional. Be polite. Be positive. Use hashtags. We've already talked about what those are, and they can increase engagement and let people know the, the, the ideas that you're talking about. You want to retweet others. Social media is social. Make sure you're amplifying the voice of people that are putting out good science content or good ideas. Use images and GIFs for more uh, engagement. Join into conversations. Offer your perspective or, or ask questions. And people are always saying, well, how much should we share or not share? And that line is going to be different for everyone. My general rule of thumb for myself is I don't want to say anything online that I wouldn't say at the company Christmas party or at my family dinner table. You know, the line's a little blurry in some cases, but just make sure, again, professional, polite, and positive. And it's okay to be a lurker. You don't always have to be putting stuff out there. You can spend some time online getting to know the platform and getting to know the expectations before you jump in. So here's some ideas of things as, a, as an education professional that you can assign to your students. Uh, for instance, they could follow 10 new scientists each week on various topics. Or maybe if you want them to generate some content and really start discussion, they could post an interesting or cool thing about their research every day or something interesting or uh, fun that they learned in class that day. Uh, some of the things that the science teacher, Adam Taylor, said that he does with his students to help them find scientists is to find an active science hashtag, in this case, for instance, like volcanoes or you could use earthquakes, anything like that. Roll your mouse over the name of the person and that'll bring their biography information up. You want to look for keywords, seismologist, volcanologist, geologist, PhD student, and then have them scroll through the last many tweets. And, and this is really just seeing if the person is active and if they're actually talking about things that you're interested in learning about for the science environment. So have they tweeted about the topic at hand? Have they tweeted, replied, or responded to someone in the last few tweets? Are they an active part of the conversation? Once you've decided that they are, you follow that person, and then you go to their, if you look at this image over here, there's a thing that says following. Those are the people that that person is following. So you click on that and it'll bring up information about all of their friends or their people they're following. And then you can find other geologists, volcanologists, whoever you may be interested in. Birds of a feather flock together. Ornithologists are just the same. So this is about a particular example. Uh, uh, sure, so this is an example from somebody who's actually on this webinar right now. This is from, uh, from Gerilyn, one of the students in a short course that we led a couple months ago. And our, um, as a, a final assignment, um, this, is, this is out of the classroom, but this can be done with classes as well. Um, the final assignment was, very open to explore a communication medium to a non-expert audience and science community or sorry social media um, was one of those options and that's what Gerilyn decided to do she was required to um, fill out a strategy and I just put a link in that chat window to the UNAVCO science communication uh, web page where we have uh, a strategy document that you could use with your students to get people thinking about not only doing social media but what they want to get out of it um, and how they can approach that, how they can reach their goals on social media. Um, and and Gerilyn uh, proposed to uh, create posts about, specifically about women uh, in her department at UC Riverside where she is a PhD student. And she asks uh, each person that she features, what are you studying? Why should we care? And why is it exciting for you? So really basic questions that the public will be interested in. And this um, exercise is great because it forces both Gerilyn and the women she interviews, the scientists she interviews, to have to describe their science and why it matters in an understandable way, in short sentences, um, simple language. And, um, and Gerilyn said it's gotten her to get to talk to people in her department and understand their research and what they're working on better, um, as well as being able to practice those science communication skills. And she's done some great things here with her posts where she's, she's using, um, she's using these, uh, the handles of relevant 
uh, organizations. So she's tagging or she's calling out UCR Science News so that her institution knows about this and can retweet it. She's calling out 500 Women Scientists, an organization focused on promoting women in science so they can retweet it. She's using the hashtag SciComm so people can search for it. Um, and she's actually doing this across multiple platforms. So this is from Twitter, this is from Facebook. She's also doing this on Instagram. So it'll be really interesting at the end of the summer to see what she learns about the, the different platforms. Good job, Jane. We're super proud of you. <laughs> totally proud, totally proud. Okay, so we've talked about how you can use social media in the classroom, but this is the part where I want you to take off your educator hat and put on your scientist hat. So why is social media uh, important for talking about science? And this is something that we all know and something that's widely discussed, but once you leave the formal learning environment, you know, when do people ever learn about science and how do they learn about science? How do they keep up to date on scientific advancements and things that are happening? Generally, it's been from television, it's been from newspapers, magazines, things like that. Well, now 60 plus percent of American adults are getting their news from social media. So on the left, these are all images from uh, the Pew Research Center. On the left, it shows that uh, about 63 percent of American adults are getting some amount of their news from Twitter and Facebook. About one in four people are getting their news from multiple social media sites, but people that use Facebook tend to only use Facebook to get news. And so those of us who are science communicators or going to be science communicators, Facebook isn't a platform that we can dismiss. We need to, to be working on uh, talking to people on Facebook. Now, most Americans still rely on general news outlets to get their science news, but most people don't think that they're getting the facts right about the news. Some good news, uh, people are actively seeking out uh, and looking to consume science news and are frequently consuming science news. The bad news is about only a quarter of social media users trust social media platforms as a source of science news. So basically nobody has any trust in the people that are reporting science to them. They don't trust the news outlets, they don't trust social media, and this is a good thing in some respects. We want people to be critical about where they're getting their sources. But this is where you as a scientist come in. You've gained credibility through your studies and through your field, and so you can use that credibility, particularly on the social networks that you already have. People know you, they know you're a scientist, and they trust that. So does the scientist really actually trust you know, scientists that they don't know. Well, communicator credibility has two components. The first one is expertise, which you have already. And the second one is trust. Trust is the, in this case, the inferred motivation to be truthful. We could call it your intent. So these are some words that were used uh, in a study by Fisk and Dupree to describe scientists. Some of them are great. Smart, intelligent, curious, thoughtful, dedicated, male. We have some work to do on the diversity issues, but we're gonna do it, right? We're gonna do it, you guys. So uh, when they were talking about scientists, they were also talking about other professions as well. And she had people rank um, professions based on um, intent. In this case, it's equated to warmth and capability or competence. And so the graph that they created of all these different professions, people had rated warmth on the y-axis and competence on the x-axis. So there are professions that rate high in both warmth and competence. And those are things, altruistic professions that we all think of like teachers and nurses and childcare workers. Unfortunately for us, researchers and scientists are uh, rated high in competency, but not rated very high in warmth. The public doesn't have a lot of trust in us. So if we have these social networks of people who already trust us, our friends and family or people that already know us, we could use these social networks to talk about science and to really disseminate more really good high quality science information. So we know that scientists are already using social media between 75 and 80% of academic researchers are on social media, but scientists are only infrequently posting about science. And this is really missing an opportunity because scientists, especially early career scientists have social networks that are populated by non-scientists and Importantly, these networks are often ideologically and politically diverse. So in this uh, image right here, over on the x-axis, or sorry, the y-axis over here, these are uh, people self-ranking themselves as liberals, moderate, or conservatives. And then these are their Facebook friends and how they would rank them, conservative, moderate, or liberal. You can see there's a pretty good mix. This is really an opportunity to reach out 
and talk to people about science who may have different ideological and political views than we have. And people always say, you know, I'm not going to argue on Facebook. There's really no point. I'm not going to put this up on Facebook. There's no point. But Messing and Westwood have shown that passive exposure to new information can change public perception and behavior. And Karen Kirk gave an excellent talk about this at AGU. This slide is from her presentation where she was looking at a climate change discussion amongst people on Reddit. And one of the people on there said that repeated exposure to the overwhelming evidence of climate change, partially thanks to persistent posters on Facebook, finally got through to me. And the points that Karen makes, facts do change people's minds, but not always, not immediately, not if they're irrelevant, not if they're from an unsavory source, not if they're thrown in people's faces, and not if they're delivered with insults. Respect is of paramount importance, especially when we're talking about contentious issues. Take it away, Beth. Right, contentious issues, yes. So, um, great lead-in, next slide. Um, contentious communication, so what we're talking about here is, um, is controversial topics or also correcting misinformation. So we all as scientists and or educators um, do, do a lot of both of these things. Um, some controversial, issues or contentious topics include um, things that we encounter include things like climate change, evolution, uh, gender, diversity, and inclusion can be a really dark area on the internet. Um, shape and age of the earth, conspiracy theories, science in general, we can feel on the defensive on these topics and, um, and often feel like we have the right information that we just need to get out there. Next. Wendy's got control of the slides. Um, so, so as scientists, a lot of times we operate from what's called the deficit model, which a lot of you, maybe all of you are, are familiar with. Um, the idea that if we just get the information out there, people will make the right decisions and have the opinions that are based on evidence and facts. Um, and a lot of social science research is showing us that that's really, it's just not the case. Next. Um, a lot of our um, opinions and the way we see these these issues and these topics has to do with our um, our identities, has to do with our religion, has to do with political affiliation. So uh, religion is tied a lot to um, how we feel about or how we see evolution. Um, climate change opinions uh, have been tied very strongly to political affiliation. So. Um, the idea that getting information out there it alone is not enough, and research actually shows that it can uh, it can work against us. So um, this is called the boomerang effect, where we put information out there, and um, and we actually uh, crawl back further into our corners and, and get more on the defensive um, based on on information alone. Next. Um, so what we really need to do is. Um, in addition to having good information out there is really uh, think about how we're presenting the information and we need to connect with people's values and belief systems. Next. Um, so what, what can we do? It's beyond the information. Um, again, it's about how, um, how we present this. And I am, uh, again, we've got Karen Kirk in here twice because um, she's so fantastic at especially the con contentious communication. Um, step back and ask yourself, what do you want to accomplish? And Karen said it so well um, at a meeting last year, do you want to be right or do you want to be heard? Um, and this is a question that we all need to ask ourselves before we start communicating about these topics and especially before we respond to a contentious comment on um, online, on social media. So if we want to be heard, we need to connect with our audience and we need to be trusted. So going back to this idea of trust, um, trust is a tricky thing. And this is from the oatmeal. Anybody who knows the oatmeal probably knows that wherever this, uh, this cartoon is going, it does not end well. Um, it's partly why we love the oatmeal. Um, no, trust is a tricky thing. So competence, we have, we have competence. We won't necessarily lose that as educators and as scientists um, and as science educators, um, but we can lose trust. So here are some ways that we can build trust and be a trusted source. Um, and some of this, maybe all of this seems really intuitive, but it's stuff that's really easy to forget um, in the moments when, when we feel um, defensive. So we can listen to understand. Um, 
And again, not only listening, but listening to understand, really being curious about where the other person is coming from and what their, what their concerns are. Uh, we can ask questions, and this is something that we can do potentially on social media. Um, the best way, I think, to, um, to not be condescending, some people ask that. How can I not be condescending? How can I not come off as condescending when you know, people ask these questions that maybe seem ridiculous or are coming from a place of, of not really understanding the science? Um, respond without judgment. Take a breath. Take a step back and um, think about um, not just... Again, coming from a place of, of, of not judgment, um, think about that person having that question or concern or uh, opinion or frame um, in, in good faith. Um, and then affirm what you can. So yes and is a, um, it's something that comes from improvisational theater. You may be familiar, it's become very popular with science communication. Um, it's the idea of not saying no. So there are a lot of negatives, but um, we don't like to be told that we're wrong. We don't like to be told no. So if we can um, acknowledge the concern without agreeing with the problem, that's a Catherine Hayhoe technique, um, or uh, another way that I like to think about it is we don't have to tell people they're wrong to share what is right um, and affirming what we can, affirming people's um, feelings, affirming what they're feeling and their concerns, and then providing good information. Um, relating, where do we share values and experiences? Uh, how can we be transparent, kind, and understandable? That's a way to connect with people. And on the transparent note, uh, we can acknowledge uncertainty. We want to focus on what we know, but also we can build trust, at least in certain situations, by acknowledge the un acknowledging the uncertainty. Um, and sharing personal stories and testimonials. Um, a, a journalism technique is to take things local. So if we can connect with personal stories, if we can for example, with climate change, bring it to a local context that can really help people to better understand the issues. Next. Um, we can also continue to provide information. So as educators in a classroom, you have this fantastic opportunity to continue interaction with people. Social media might be a one-off, but in the classroom, you see these people several times a week. Um, we don't need to give people information about an issue all at once. Um, small doses add up. Next and choose your words thoughtfully. Um, if we don't care about being heard, we can use whatever words we want. And if we want to be heard, um, we can use tactics like avoiding charged terms um, and like climate change, like evolution, and instead describe the processes behind them, the evidence, the outcomes, and get on the same page on those issues before introducing the terms that we use uh, in science, but that may be contentious in the public sphere. Next. Okay, so on social media, what does this look like? How do we deal with trolls? Back to that word of troll. So trolls and just contentious communication in general. Uh, if somebody is there just to egg us on, we don't have to respond. Know that respond, not responding is absolutely an option for you and for your students. You're not required to engage. But is there a benefit to responding? Ask that because there might be. Um, if there's not a benefit, step back, maybe. Is it? But um, but there, there are many benefits, potential benefits. So you might want to show unbiased responsiveness, that you respond to anybody regardless of who they are. You can provide a perspective. You could get some more information out there. You can learn about other people's perspectives. So you can ask, you can have a conversation on social media, which leads to a productive, a potentially productive conversation. Um, and maybe it's not about that person on social media, but it's about everybody who's listening in. So you can use it as an opportunity for bystander education and engagement. Um, Getting, getting your message out or starting a conversation with other people listening in. Um, and one thing that we can all think about is focusing on the fence sitters or focusing on, I like to think about it as all the people in the middle of the spectrum of whatever the issue is. So um, uh, at, at one end we have the extremists and we won't necessarily be able to engage constructively with extremists, but there are a lot of people in the middle who may be getting information from extremists, but are open to whatever information we put out there as well. So we can be those trusted sources. Um, I have cousins who come to me with questions about things that they've seen on social media that are not from valid sources. Um, so I can give them a, a the more trusted scientific perspective. Next. Um, 
Think about how you're responding. Again, if you decide to respond, respond in a way that will build trust for yourself and other scientists and educators. Uh, do it for the rest of us. Uh, we can build science, we can build trust for ourselves, but also for scientists as, as a group. Next. Um, and then when do you stop responding? Well, when the conversation is no longer productive. Uh, I mean, bottom line, it's up to you, it's up to your students, it's up to whomever, but when the conversation is no longer productive, consider cutting, cutting your losses. I know um, institutions and individuals who will respond to every person once, and if the conversation continues contentiously, they drop it, uh, and that's perfectly, perfectly fine. All right, so we're gonna move on and review what we've been talking about. Uh, both the benefits of social media uh, to science education and science educators and the reasons that scientists should be using social media. And so the, the benefits for social media and science education, this was compiled again by Adam Taylor. And this is from what he has found in his classroom and all of these really resonated with me. So social media in the classroom helps to increase student participation. It helps to increase students' voices and it helps them to find their scientific voice. It builds teacher and student uh, connections because you're going to be interacting with them in an entirely new environment that takes it a little bit beyond the classroom. It increases student collaboration. Uh, they're all going to be working together on this project in an environment that they may not be familiar with and so they're going to collaborate and they'll uh, usually be pretty helpful with each other, um, you know, liking each other's things and amplifying each other's voices. It connects students with professionals and they can grow those networks as they move through their scientific career. And really, it's a good opportunity for teaching digital responsibility and digital citizenship. We expect this from our students in the digital era, but we have to teach it to them. And of course, we wanna to help to build a positive digital footprint. We hear a lot about the, the problems of social media and the vitriol online, but we can counteract that by being positive, by being good role models, by putting out good information. And again, I'm gonna refer you to Adam's blog, Two Foot Giraffe. Uh, lots of, of great information on there about how to get started using social media in the classroom that goes uh, into more depth than we were able to talk about today. So reasons that you personally as a scientist should be using social media, it uh, allows you to make connections with potential collaborators and potential mentors. It allows you to share your research and um, a lot of studies have shown that it increases citations. So that seems to be a little bit discipline uh, specific for us in our science, it looks pretty good. Uh, it helps you to learn about research outside of your primary field and keep up to date on developments and advances that you might have to expend a little bit more energy uh, to find otherwise. If you're writing grants and proposals, social media is a great way to get broader impacts. It helps you to improve your science communication. It helps to improve science communication as a whole, helps to improve general science literacy as a whole, and helps to increase the appreciation for the scope and value of science in society. And that's really critical right now helps to humanize scientists and change uh, the perspective and the representation of science. And you can use the trust that you've built through this humanization in order to correct uh, misinformation that you come across. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with this quote from the Office of Educational Technology about how technology is offering opportunities for teachers to become more collaborative and extend learning beyond the classroom. So I think now we can um, answer the questions that came in on the chat box. I'm sorry that we didn't do that uh, as they were coming in. I was too busy yakking. So uh, Mitchell, do you, how does this work now? Um, I don't have any questions. Yeah, uh, we didn't get any questions. If there are any, feel free to, to enter them now. We've got some time to answer those. And then w while, while you're thinking about it, um, uh, one thing I failed to mention with uh, with Gerilyn's work is that she encouraged conversation by um, by inviting questions for all the scientists. So uh, anybody she featured, she said, have questions, ask her. And if they were on social media, she linked to their social media accounts. Karen, that's not a question. I can't see the chat window. Oh. Uh, if, you, if you find the Zoom control bar, it should reopen as a pop-up. Uh, if you don't have any questions, it'd be great to hear from you all about how you plan to use social media, how you currently use it um, in your own work or with your students. 
Yeah, so we're getting some questions now. Wendy, can you see the? No. Okay. So I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll read this off. So um, the question is: Okay, I use Facebook both professionally and personally, but I don't understand how hashtag works, how that sign works, how they are different. What software is best for Twitter? Um, <laughs> you know, stuff that is already obvious to everyone. It's not obvious to everyone. Uh, we all have to learn it. So um, hashtags, do you want to take that, Wendy? Did you get that? Uh, hashtags are a way that you can mark a word to make it more searchable or to show people exactly um, kind of the topic that you're concentrating on. And that's mainly used just for Twitter. Although some people use it for Instagram as well and for LinkedIn. So if we, when Beth and I were promoting this webinar, we said hashtag SciComm. So people that were interested in science communication could search for that and know that it was coming. The at symbol is also used for Twitter. And so if you say, for instance, at iris underscore EPO, that's uh, how you get in touch with us. That's our name or our Twitter handle. And so those two things are different because one of them is part of the name and the other one is a way to search keywords. So a hashtag, you can make up whatever you want. You could make up a new keyword if you wanted, and the at sign. The at sign also works on Facebook if you want to, um, if you want somebody to see your post. So, so Wendy and I work at sister organizations, and if I post something that is related to Iris's work, I'll put at Iris, and I'll start typing it out. And generally, Twitter or Facebook will finish filling that in for me, and then they'll get a notification that um, that they've been called out in a post which is really helpful. It's a big part of social media, the social part of social media. That's a good um, question. Uh, okay, Karen Kirk is asking, if you only had time for one platform, would you use Twitter or Facebook? Twitter. But I'll, I'll leave that with the caveat of it's what you are most comfortable with. So part of communicating on social media is doing it on a fairly regular basis. And so if you're not comfortable with something, you're not likely to do it. So if you already have a Facebook page and you're comfortable communicating that way, do that. But for me, I find Sci Twitter to be incredibly engaging and I have found all sorts of collaborators. I found a great mentor um, on Sci Twitter and I now am connected to a lot of other uh, people around the world that were doing work that I, is related to what I'm doing. And so professionally, it's, it's made a huge difference to me in expanding the group of people that I work with. So for me, it'd be Twitter all day long. Yes. Um, yeah, I think for, for, for science, Twitter, um, although for Facebook, so my, I think it, yeah, depends, depends on what you want to accomplish. Uh, for example, if I wanted to get the word out in general about good science to um, a non-self-selecting audience, I think I would go Facebook because that's where I have friends from high school and family members and my Facebook page isn't public, so it wouldn't be uh, a huge public facing thing, but I, I could get information out to people who I'm a trusted source for and who um, are not necessarily in my immediate sphere. Um, okay, do you or anyone actually do a lesson on social media or just include it as assignments in class? Um, there's some great references, some great resources for this. Maybe we can come back to this um, at the end. Neither of us works in a classroom. So I know we're doing a webinar for educators without actually working in a classroom ourselves. Um, but there's... Best. Yes, yes. Um, and we... Um, uh, a great reference is um, Paige Jaro's work. I don't know, Mitchell, if you're familiar with that, and if you can pull up a link to that. If not, I'll post in a minute. Um, but Paige Jaro has, uh, she blogs from um, from the lab bench. Is that right? Anyone? Okay, yeah. from the lab bench. Um, and she um, has done a lot of work on Instagram with scientists and with students. And I think there actually may have been an entire class that was devoted to Instagram. Um, Wendy, do you have any comments on that or do you want to come back? Um, I think there are resources out there. Like Beth said, we're not in the classroom, so we don't teach that. We do workshops just on social media and best practices. And I, I think those could probably be pretty easily um, modified for classroom use, but that would take some, some time and some, some thought. 
Can you speak to the difference between posting as an individual versus posting as a member of an organization? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wendy. Um, different organizations have different rules about what you can post and uh, some of them are more strict than others. The USGS has a lot of uh, rules about their communications with the public. And then other organizations like IRIS and UNAVCO have people that are uh, dedicated to doing those things, but then we have a lot more latitude. Um, I do follow very specific guidelines. I have a social media strategy for my work with IRIS, and I'm always making sure that my goals and motivations are meeting up with that strategy. There are uh, trusted sources that I use. I'm much more careful about wording. Um, you know, because we're an NSF funded nonprofit, you know, we, we can't be political in any way. And so making sure that there's not that crossover and that everything is scientific and objective is very important. Whereas on my personal accounts, I try to show myself more. I try and do what I preach and humanize myself. So I have political posts. I have posts about the, um, you know, my charity work and my volunteer work and my cat and my kids and all sorts of different things. So it's a much broader scope. And I intersperse the science in there. So, you know, look, I was doing this code and it failed and that's two hours wasted. And now I'm off for a cup of coffee because I just can't today, sort of things. What about making language simpler? I used to argue with scientists I work with because I want simpler language. What do you think about that? Well, I have strong opinions on that, so I will <laughs> respond. <laughs> um, I think simpler language is fantastic. AGU has an entire blog called The Plain Spoken Scientist. Um, I think that we can reach a broad audience, multi-generational, various educational backgrounds. Um, if we, and, and by educational background, I mean specific education, various knowledge backgrounds. So people outside of geoscience, um, I think we can reach by using simple language to talk about things that are interesting to scientists in our field and interesting to everyone else as well. And if we use simple language, everybody can access that information and that knowledge, not only the people in the specific field. Um, I do think there's a place for jargon. So I don't want to pretend that we should throw all those words out the window. Um, it, it enables scientists to speak, um, to communicate efficiently and effectively. Um, and I think it's fine to use jargon when we're talking with the public so long as we define it. So you know, use it sparingly and define our terms. Um, but I don't know if this is addressing exactly what you're thinking of, but I am, I'm all about simple language, simple language and also descriptive language because when we use that descriptive language, it takes, the message from up here to down, I know you can't see my gut, I'm not going to stand up for you, but um, it, it, takes, um, it takes it to a place of feeling. If we talk about something as gooey, we can see it, we can imagine it, we can feel it. Um, so I'm a language person. I'm all about it. I don't know. Wendy, do you have anything to add to that? I have, I, I have similar feelings to Beth. Um, we're taught as scientists to use the jargon, you know, and then we have to unlearn it once we've learned it in order to do effective communication with, um, with the public, with people outside of our fields. And I think a lot of times scientists hide behind the jargon. You know, we have this idea that if we show ourselves as emotional, if we show ourselves as human beings, then we'll be seen as less objective as scientists. And I think people hide behind the jargon so that they look more objective and more scientific. And we need to get away from that because we really, we're not going to sway people and we're not particularly on contentious issues by um, swaying them with facts and logic. We're going to get them in the gut using their emotions. So I think it's important to do that. There are a lot of tools out there and we're working a lot of us to help scientists to clarify and to simplify their language. There's lots of things like the de-jargonizer and Upgoer 5. If you haven't seen Upgoer 5, you should look it up. It's pretty awesome. And it's trying to define your science or talk about your science using the thousand most common words. And it's, you know, it's really fun. Um, so there's so many questions in only five minutes. Mitchell, or is there anything in particular you think we should address if you've been following this? I'd say keep answering questions for as long as we can. And we oh. can probably go a few minutes over and People can leave as they need Thanks to. Thanks for all your questions, everybody. This is awesome. Yeah, this is great. This is super exciting. Um, okay, so then what was next? I, I have a math and science Facebook page, shares resources for educators, also shares activities. I think that's just a, a comment, but that's um, 
That's great. So it's a way to share resources for, for educators as well as getting science out there. That's awesome. Um, I've heard that with Twitter, you need to post frequently to be able to make it worth the time. Do you agree with this? Um, yeah, I mean, but frequently, frequently is up to you. There are definitely people that post too much, but there's definitely a thing as posting too little. And if you want to grow a following, um, you know, it depends on your objectives. Again, are you there mainly to connect with other scientists? Are you there to uh, get out your research? Are you there, you know, what, what are you trying to do there? So if you're using it kind of like um, some of my friends use it, it's more like a news feed. So you can follow other scientists and other research and breaking news and science organizations and different journals. That's fine. You can use it however, however you like. If you want to use it for science communication, in order to build a following, you have to post regularly often. But again, that's, that's definable. Like by, by how much time you have, I call it like a cup of coffee thing. So I'll get my first cup of coffee and I'll scroll through Twitter to find some interesting things. I'll comment on some things that I see and then I'll share some things that I see. And once I'm done with my coffee, I'm done with Twitter for until the next cup of coffee. Which I always think is funny because I nurse a cup of coffee for like four hours. Probably, probably wouldn't <laughs> would be the best approach. Um, this is, here's a, here's a, a complex one. This is like, I mean, everything really is this whole wormhole. This could be multiple hours of a, a webinar instead of just one, but do you have any advice about the instantaneous nature of social media? I worry about impulse control in terms of thinking before speaking of type or typing. Do you have any guidance on how to develop those thoughtful pausing skills amongst 18 to 20 year olds or anyone for that matter? Yes. I have, I have a thing about this. I, I've been giving this a lot of thought. Um, there's a thing you can do on Twitter called a thread where you make one tweet and then you can actually kind of make it into a story, 280 characters at a time. And so it'll thread it all together for you. So they're all connected and people can see that it's a connected thread. And that way, if you can require, particularly if it's a strong reaction, if you can require that they create a thread, they have to almost step out of the moment, get away from the platform and do it in like a word document or writing it down because it's hard to do 280 characters, right? And so if they have to come up with these complex ideas, that helps to slow them down and make them think. I do this for myself. If I've come across something that I am upset about and I wanna just fire something off, I'm like, nope, thread your response. And if it's about science or something like that, I will make sure that I include references to support my ideas. And that way I have to really uh, do some critical thinking and so you can actually make it into kind of a lesson about critical thinking, constructing an argument, and then that takes the time to let them cool off and actually like think it through. Yeah, I mean, I imagine even having to type something out in a Word document before copying and pasting it, even if it's a, a single tweet, just that step would be a pause to think. And that's a great skill. So many of these skills are great life skills as well as social media skills. And so that would be, you know, a way to get a little life lesson in as well. And also the, um, the netiquette checklist, you can create or, or you know, um, pull a netiquette checklist and make sure that before they tweet anything, they have to check all those boxes. Is it polite? Is it necessary? Is it constructive? Is it true? And so if they actually have to think through those different points and evaluate, you know, self-evaluate what they're putting out into the world, that may be a way to kind of help curtail that impulsiveness. Um, Natalie pointed out that hashtags and at signs are used the same way on Instagram too. Um, and that's true. Instagram and Twitter are both very searchable, which makes those hashtags in particular really, really important. Um, how often do you recommend somebody, someone post to Twitter? I think you kind of address this, Wendy. Again, it depends on your objectives. Um, if depending on what they may be, it may be a few times a week. Uh, for Iris, I try and either post or retweet something between six and eight times a day, but that's an official organization. We're trying to actively disseminate science information and it's part of my job. So, you know, that's maybe more than you would want to do. As a, a private citizen Twitter user, I probably do stuff, I don't know, I send out maybe 20 tweets a week and I tend to have like a day where something happened and I have a lot to say about it. Super fun, Kilauea fissure just opened up and then somebody's house gets burned and I'm like sad about that and want to share all those things. And then the next day I don't post anything. So, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do. 
Um, this is a great uh, comment in my paleontology that Alexa says in my paleontology, paleo, sorry, paleoclimatology class, I use social media to address climate and misconceptions. Each student gathered a collection of comments and then as a class we categorized the misconceptions into broad categories. Um, that's cool. That's a cool idea. Here's a trollish question. This is not a trollish question, by the way. Are there, this is, this is a total science-y question. It's not even close to troll. Oh, we could tell you about trolls. Are there any data-driven studies that scientists engaging in social media is improving public's perceptions of science? Yes. Um, and no. So there are, uh, there's a lot of published literature about science communication on social media, about how scientists are using social media. And I don't know of any of them. Many of them are making really good points. How it's changing uh, public perception is hard to effectively identify. So um, whoever that is, you can send me an email and I can link you to a lot of the literature. Um, some people make more compelling cases than others, but, but overall, you know, there, there is some work being done in that area. Um, Naomi has some nice comments, thank you, and asked for us to share our handles or page links, et cetera. Um, yes, we can. Mitchell, should we just do that here in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we can do that. Um, totally follow back. <laughs> yes, we'll absolutely follow you back. Um, uh, given the amount of time one would need to read and tweet every day, how do you balance this with time that must be devoted to teaching institutional administrative committee work and research? I think Wendy's addressed that. It's, um, it's challenging. It's a matter of prioritization, cost benefit, uh, not for everyone, but get that cup of coffee and take as long as Wendy does to drink it, not as long as I do to drink it. Although um, I had put some things up from Heidi Stelzer, and one of the comments that she had posted that I didn't put up there was oh. that she actually thinks that social media shortens her class preparation time uh, because when she's looking for you know new things to talk about or things to put into lectures, she can just go to social media and find it more quickly than if she had to Google and go through the whole thing because she already has trusted sources that she can either ask or reference or find their references quickly by doing searches. So once you have some degree of comfort and familiarity, I think it can potentially speed up some of the things you have to do, administrative things, what are any of us gonna do? But you know, with the teaching and finding new subject matter, finding images, finding lesson plans, those sorts of things, it can really be helpful. Yeah, you can leverage, leverage both and use some of that when you're coming up with lesson plans and such, put some of that material onto social media. So try to try to leverage that time. And the time, I mean, time is, is hard to, to manage at the best of times. And I know that social media seems like one more thing that you're supposed to do. I mean, I totally get it. Um, how can social media be framed to employers as part of our professional responsibilities? Beyond altmetrics, are there easy ways to orient social media efforts over time towards professional or publication outcomes? Yes, I can send you, if you email me, bohon at iris.edu, I can email you references to how it improves citations, how it improves visibility, all those sorts of things that can help with framing. Uh, I've been actively trying to make geoscience ed visual and accessible through Instagram but I really don't think that I've been successful reaching people beyond my students and friends and the odd random follower. So that's, that's the challenge with, um, uh, well, I guess also my question would be, is your Instagram page public? Twitter is, is very public. Facebook, I think not as public. It's more about our networks. Um, and Instagram, I feel can go either way. If you're, um, yeah, I guess my thought on that would be hashtags. Also, uh, this is where amplification can really come in. Um, in your social networks, make sure that you reach out to people, you know, make some initial effort and say, hey, I'm doing this thing, I've got this great page that I'm working on, can you help to amplify it? And a lot of times people will be like, they'll check it out and be like, yeah, this is awesome, people should know about it, and then they'll promote it on their site, more people will see it, more people will join up. So, you know, it's a little bit of you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of thing. But in general, we're all looking to promote good science and good science content. And so when that comes across your desk, when that scrolls across your feed, people want to make sure that others are going to see it. So reaching out 
um, into particular individuals and groups uh, can make a difference in uh, your visibility. And here's a good suggestion. There are tons more messages, by the way, um, which is great. Um, here's a, a recommendation. Do a weekly post, same day every week, at the same time as much as possible. Let your followers develop a habit. Um, note for those less familiar with side Twitter, especially Geo Twitter, there are different themes for almost every day, such as hashtag Mineral Monday, Tectonics Tuesday, Thin Section Thursday, Fossil Friday. And this could be a Friday. Friday Folds. What's that? Or, yeah, Friday Folds. That's my favorite one says the, the paleo seismologist. Um, this could be a really fun way to get started and participate in a bigger fun conversation and maybe garner a few new followers who are searching for those hashtags. Sure, and there's also Throwback Thursday, which is, which is general, not specific to the geoscience community, so you can trick some non-scientists to come in and, and check out your science, um, which I'm all, all about, is getting out of the, the self-selecting scientists. Um, a fun Twitter hashtag to explain your science without the jargon, hashtag in other words. Yes. I like it. Thanks, Gerilyn. Um, uh, another suggestion I found keeping up with Twitter about twice per day helps to reduce the time it takes. There's so much information, it can be overwhelming. Here, here. Many scientists are able to check it throughout the day. She checks it once in the morning and uh, once in the evening for about 10 minutes and finds that that's, that's enough. enough. Okay. Um, uh, love the netiquette idea. Helpful for parenting too. True. Um, oh, somebody just found us. Good. Already following Wendy. Well, <laughs> that's okay. I'm not that active on Twitter. I admit it. Um, oh, and maybe I'm at the bottom now. Uh, Alexa says I'm in a research specific. I'm in research specific groups on social media. The constant updates of paper directly linked in the news feed and related to my research helps me keep up on the literature. Awesome. So again, it's a professional use. Helps helps Alexa professionally. Alexa. Um, Oh, <laughs> so Natalie's on Instagram, but bad at hashtags. Fair enough. Um, okay, so I'm trying to figure out, there we go. So um, Wendy, I'm gonna type in uh, Wendy and my, Wendy, you're still not on the chat. No, I can see it now because you took oh. over the screen. Okay, so I'll put my hashtag on here. Um, and it sounds like Mitchell, you have a few things to say. Yeah, just really quickly, I know everyone probably has to out. Um, if you've enjoyed this conversation and want to continue it, I would encourage you to attend the Earth Educators Rendezvous happening this July at the University of Kansas. Uh, Beth and Wendy will actually be leading a workshop on this very topic, two days, uh, much better than about just an hour. Um, so we'd encourage you to register for some or all of the rendezvous and and hope that you can can join us there and come introduce yourselves to us we're only there on thursday and friday but um come introduce yourselves even if you're not in our fantastic workshop and thank you so much for coming we really appreciate um listening to what we have to say and re uh, really quickly just a couple more things i'll mention uh this is our last webinar of the fall integrate webinar series so we encourage you to check back in August for this, or the end of the spring webinar series and I encourage you to check back in August for the fall webinar series. Um, please think about coming to the rendezvous uh, this summer. There is a discussion thread that I've put together. So if you'd like to keep discussing this with your peers online, uh, you can do so. I've linked to that from the chat box. And finally, uh, we appreciate your feedback and ideas. So I'll post a link to the webinar evaluation form uh, and it would be great if you'd spend a few minutes to, to fill out that. Um, to wrap up, thank you Beth and Wendy for a fantastic webinar and being willing to stay an extra couple of minutes. Thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you at a future in a great event. Thanks everybody. Thank you.